Welcome everyone to the first episode of Varieties of Early Christianity. And you might be wondering, varieties of early Christianity? Well, Christianity is diverse today. You have your Protestants, you have your Catholics, and your Eastern Orthodox. But before the Reformation, and especially before the Great Schism, shouldn't we be talking about Christianity, not this varieties thing? And to that I'd say Christianity was actually even more diverse back then than it is today. And if you know anything about early Christianity, you might have heard of some of these groups. There are the Gnostics, the Montanists, the Marcionists, generally what people call the heresy of early Christianity. But historians generally don't like using the terms orthodoxy and heresy to describe these early groups, and here's why. Orthodoxy and heresy. There are two terms that you've probably heard before, but you might not know what they mean. Today, orthodoxy describes almost all Christian denominations. Whether you are Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, or any number of the denominations of Protestantism, your theology probably aligns itself with the Nicene Creed, which historically sums up Christian orthodoxy. The idea that there's a Trinitarian God, three persons and one deity, and Jesus Christ is the incarnation of this God, who was actually born of a virgin, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who died and he rose again and ascended into heaven, and all the other points. And historically, groups like the Gnostics and the Marcionites were called heretics because they deviated from this theology. Now, my first year of graduate school, I wrote a paper on the Docetists, and Docetism is the belief that Jesus didn't really have a fleshly body, but it only seemed to be a human body. And all throughout this paper I referred to Docetism as a heresy. Docetists believe this heresy, the Apocryphon of John, is a heretical text that has Docetist undertones, and when I got the paper back it had red marks all over it. And that day I discovered that historians don't like using this term heretic. And this is the problem that historians have using the term heresy. Heresy is an insider's term. It is a term saying, I am right and you are wrong but no one would really call themselves a heresy. They would call themselves the people that got it right. So if historians start going around and saying the Montanists are heretics and the Docetists are heretics, they're tacitly buying into this ancient us versus them rhetoric. A good historian needs to be able to step back and see that heresy was being used as a weapon to differentiate between two different groups. Now the second problem of using the orthodoxy versus heresy dichotomy in historical studies is that it papers over the fact that Christianity was massively diverse in antiquity. It makes it sound like that Christianity was two main groups, the mainstream orthodoxy fighting pesky heretics, and the orthodox group was the centralized authority fighting them off. But this isn't exactly historically correct. There was no mainstream yet, and there was no main centralized church authority this early. It's very easy to pick the winner of a horse race after the race is done, but if you transport it back in time to the second century, you would have no idea that the proto-orthodox groups were eventually going to triumph. Mont Martinism, Marcionism, and the various Gnostic groups were doing very well for themselves. Now, to illustrate this problem, I did a Google image search for the development of Christianity to see where these ancient heresies fit into the conversation. You see, early Christianity, a big stem, kind of like the trunk of a tree, and as time goes on, branches of Christianity start breaking off. You have the Assyrian Church, then the Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism split, and then the Protestant Reformation. But what does this infographic assume? It assumes that Christianity was unified from the start. And this simply is not an accurate picture of church history. Paul and Peter themselves were fighting vehemently from the very beginning, if you read the book of Galatians. And Paul spends most of his time complaining against other Christian groups. Because most Christians are Nicene Christians today, we tend to focus on the hints of Nicenism back then. But it's important to remember that the proto-Orthodox groups were just another branch of a very complicated stem. Now don't get me wrong, the groups that eventually formed Nicene Christianity were very popular. That's why they won. But it's important to remember that this process took centuries and the proto-Orthodox groups themselves didn't always get along. In actuality, the late Roman Empire was the wild, wild west of Christianity. You had sheriffs like Irenaeus and Justin Martyr trying to keep Christians in line with their proto-Orthodox thinking, but most Christians simply didn't care about the finer points of theology. Not least of which because 90% of them were illiterate and were trying pretty hard not to die from typhus or being caught by the Huns. A more accurate development tree of Christianity would look something like this. A supernova of Jesus-following communities all stemming from traditions about Jesus. Each one of these lines represent a different Christian group or community. Figures like the famous Gnostic Valentinus or the church father Irenaeus sparked their own mini supernovas of new and unique Christian groups. Rather than a linear model of increasing diversity, we see diversity from the very start in the Nova model of early Christianity, as dozens of overlapping and interacting Christian groups all grow out of the seminal Jesus traditions. And I'm not making this stuff up. One of the most famous historians of early Christianity in the past 100 years, Walter Bauer, wrote a book called Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. In this book, he argues that Christianity did not develop uniformly throughout the Mediterranean. 
That is to say, the Christianity that developed in Syria developed differently than that in Egypt and Asia Minor and elsewhere. They were never orthodox in the first place. They developed their own distinct doctrines before orthodoxy moved in and became the norm. These hard boundaries that we draw between religions today were a lot more blurry back then. People back then did not convert to a neatly packaged systematic Christian theology but rather they appropriated Christian ideas and symbols into their already existing beliefs and practices. So all this to say, I think heresy is a fine term for theological discussion, but we should be very careful to use this term for historical studies because it assumes a dominant relationship between Nicene Christianity and the rest of Christianity during a time when this dominant relationship just didn't exist yet. If we want a truly accurate picture of ancient Christianity, we should be careful not to be influenced by ancient biased rhetoric. Now, a lot of Bauer's conclusions have been reworked over the past century, but he alerted us to a very vital fact for an accurate picture of early Christianity. Christianity was massively diverse from the very start. It was so diverse that some scholars don't even like using the singular, Christianity, to describe this religion, but rather the plural, Christianities. Now, I personally think this is a little bit of an exaggeration, so that's why I'm titling the series Varieties of Early Christianity. Not only is it a value-neutral term, but it reminds us that Nicene Christianity didn't spring from some big, perfect, unified stem but rather a bunch of competing and overlapping groups that appear wrong or deviant or heretical only in retrospect. Thanks for subscribing and watching, and I'll see you next time.